All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Mind of George Show, a free-for-all Friday, and the Mind of George, it belongs in a straight jacket, but luckily podcasting lets me share it with you. And speaking of straight jackets on the mind, I have to give a proper intro to my friend who's on the podcast today. I am super stoked to have Michael Burnoff, wrote a book called Average Sucks, and basically helps businesses and people optimize their life, move from where they are to where they want to go, and helps people like me that have struggled with self-sabotage and mind blocks and past traumas get through them and realize that we don't have to be a victim of our past and that in every moment we get to choose where we go with all the tools, situations, and some of the best energy without the creepy hand clapping that I've ever seen when it comes to personal development. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome my friend Michael to the show. Michael, good to see you, man. I appreciate it, brother. You'll be zero hand, like, that's all you get is hand clapping right there. That's the creepiest, creepiest we get, George. So this is it's exciting to be here. I appreciate the invite, and let's uh, change some lives. Yeah, man, I'm stoked. And we were we were overdue for a catch-up, everybody. So I just yep. said, get on the podcast, and we'll just catch up there, and we'll tell it a day. Yep. And so, uh, Michael, the first question, this kind of kicks everything off for everybody on my show. But when you think back, you've been in this game for a long time. You've been doing personal development. You've been doing business. You've been doing high-level coaching. You've just been helping people transform their lives. But when you look back and reflect on yours and Deborah's journey, what was the biggest mistake that you ever made? And what did you learn from it? Interesting. Uh, biggest mistake overall, or the one that I keep on making that I'm looking to get out of. I mean, you just, <laughs> what, you just, you tell what, me which one. I'll go. I'll go either direction. Let's go. Let's go both because we don't have a short show. So let's go both. Okay. No, no, number one is hiring myself. I'd say that's the biggest mistake I made in business. Is looking for me mm. has been the biggest mistake over I've made over the years. I kept on, I kept on bringing on people I like, I enjoy, I want to hang out with. They're my buddies. They're my peers. And it was probably the biggest mistake I ever made. And I, I caught on to this after watching the the Men Who Built America, that show. And I watched that Carnegie had brought on a guy named Frick, who was the absolute opposite of him. It took me eight years and probably cost me half a million dollars in salaries and different things over the years, bringing on high-level people that were identical to me that were not the opposite of me. And that's been my biggest mistake, I'd say, in business. One of the hardest things that I've had to work on getting over is finding the missing link instead of finding a companion. It's crazy as it sounds. It's actually a really good one. And so what's the one you keep making over and over? You know, you know, it's interesting is every time we do really, really well, which is all the time, right? We get to this point where we've got this little chunk of this little chunk of space and time and meaning like we've got extra time we've got extra money we're in a good spot which is predominantly my life but we get this little bit extra i get this feeling every once in a while that i can buy my problem away meaning that i can hire a person i can get a thing and do it instead of i realize that i've got to do that myself so i'm not saying you can't grow you can't scale you can't hire but i'm just saying a lot of times when i get comfortable i have found that I look for, and I'm way beyond the normal comfort of people, but I find that I want to get to the next level. And I think if I just throw money at it or throw something at it, I can make it go away instead of realizing that I got to put a little pieces in place myself first before I can add that extra thing or person. So that's been a big one for me. Hopefully that makes sense. So am I, I breaking up or am I good? Am I no, good you're, per- your you're perfect. You're perfect. perfect. I, um, I want to actually unpack that because I think – that's probably one of the most common themes in the entrepreneurial world I see. It's just the wrapping paper changes, right? We get yep. to that place and it's like it's like silent self-sabotage and the comfort comes and then you're like, oh, let off the gas pedal for a minute. Okay, I have this space. And for me, it happens a lot. But what ends up happening for me is like I'll be recording podcasts like crazy and I'll get a big buffer and I'll slow down and then I'm behind again, right? And I actually yep. let go of the thing that created the space in the first place and then expect yes. me to be able to recreate it overnight. And yes. so I think it's a super, super common thing. I know for me, it isn't everybody I works with. So as you recognize that, right, I think you nailed something that's so powerful. In the entrepreneur world, we hear it all the time. Well, if you have money, you don't have a problem. I was like, well, that's true to a sense, except the foundation still looks the same. And so yes. you can build another floor as much as you want, but the foundation still can't support it. So like when you say for you, Like doing the work on me or looking in like, what are you talking about and what do you look at and what work are you doing to help set yourself up to get to that next level? Well, I'll give give you a prime example. So I'm the best promoter of what I do, meaning that when I promote what I do, I'm, there's, there's two beliefs. I talked to someone recently and said the fastest way to change what you do is to stop believing you're the best at what you do. Even though there's certain things I'm phenomenal at, the best in the world at language, communication, I'm one of the best in the world at that. 
believing that is probably a limitation inside of myself because as soon as I believe I'm the only one that can do it, I give up looking or trying to find anybody to help me. So I'll give you an example. I, I bring on uh, business people to, I bring on, forgive me, I bring on myself. I'm excited about what it is that I do. I get excited. I pump out our business. We make things happen. I promote, I sell, I do. And then I get busy with the infrastructure of taking care of all of it. And then I forget to put in place the things that work. Like for instance, if I'm training somebody new and I was working with them, instead of just training them the way I'd normally train them, train them how to do what I do, show them the things that I do. Instead of thinking this old way of training or this old way of sharing, like give an example. If I'm great at selling what I do, I'm great at promoting, great at selling, I do some amazing stuff from stage. How do I duplicate that inside of another person? So doing the work to take the time to actually educate somebody to do it rather than I did the work. Did you see what I did? And I hope you can do it. That's a big piece of the puzzle. Yeah. If I, makes, if, yeah, no, 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 it makes sense. It's, it's, it's something I, and pick an analogy. You're the language expert here. I just dabble yep. in it. I dabble in the dark arts of language to get myself in trouble, <laughs> right? Like that's how I see it. But I think, I think what you nailed is that, you know, I, I have that same thing. I've thought about it before. Like there's things in the world that I'm quote unquote the best at and then still having to improve, but I stay there. And then when somebody comes in, I hand them an outcome and I expect them to get yep. there a certain way without yep. giving them the actual waypoints or the touch points to get there that way. And the truth is, is that what I've struggled with, because I'm just going full disclosure in the beginning, is a lot of the times I don't know how I got there because I don't take the time to reflect or sit down or create that space to no. make it repeatable because that gets into my fear of success, right? Or my story might be wrong or, you know, all those different pieces. And so uh, Keith Cunningham nailed this one for me in his book, uh, The Road Less Stupid, where he talked about thinking. That's a time. great book. Oh, it's so good. I mean, it kicks me in the nuts every time I listen to it in the best ways. But uh, yeah, that thinking time has been a really, really powerful determinant for me on like just getting clarity and realizing that business and, and I'm, I'm pretty sure personal development would be the same way is that my thought with entrepreneurship is like immediate gratification, right? Like if I do this, I'll have this. If I launch this, I'll make this. But it's just these short-term results over and over and over again. And I feel like I've made those swings in my life as well yep. to where it's like, oh man, I got dad bod during COVID. Go run 12 miles and I'm broken the next day, right? Or like, oh, I pissed him off when I said this. I'm just not going to speak for the next six days, right? Like all those extremes. So like how do you – navigate that response. So I, I, and I'm only going to speak for myself. You can use me an example yourself or whatever, but I know that there's times in our life where we're hit with this clarity or we have to hire or we get met with this resistance or this fear comes up and we can either react or respond. And, and I know I practice daily trying to increase that wedge between, you know, trigger and response, but like, what do you do? What's your practice? What do you recommend people do that? So it's not hasty and they can get into training that person the right way or, you know, replicating their self. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So do me a favor because my ADD just kicked in massively. I'm going to ask you the question. <coughs> Could you summarize that question? There's a bunch of pieces of the puzzle. Where do you want me to start on that? Because that's yeah. a big old question. No, it's good. I want to get this for the listener. I want to get that so pinpointed where there's just like an exact answer. Yeah. So I'm driving uh, the Zygarnik effect home to the T with Michael right now. But the, the core of the question is entrepreneurs are going to be faced with either I need to hire somebody, growth, yep. boom, boom, boom. And a lot of them are emotional-based situations. They're either yep. hit with fear or something along those lines. And they have two choices. They can react or respond, right? So how do you recommend somebody navigates that so we're not making reactive decisions just trying to buy our way out of the problem and getting yep. into the steps or the waypoints required both personally and for the people on the receiving end got it so the first the first thing we've got to figure out is i believe you said it earlier we got to be outcome focused and yeah. the one thing is we've got to know what it is that we're after and what it is we want at the end of the day and i think that's one of the biggest mistakes people make i teach this in my hit program as simple as it is a lot of times we think outcomes is just our goals but they're asking the big question is like what do we want this to do that's a crazy question and it's the people that can ask that question a lot that really get really comfortable. Like, what do we want this to do? Like, I, I play ice hockey, right? Yep. So I'm going out. Like, am I going to just go play hockey? Or like, what do I want to do this shift? Where are we at? Look on the ice, the, the pucks in the deep zone. What is my out to get it out of the zone as quickly as I can, uh, use energy effectively, and then go up the other side of the ice. So most people, what I've recognized is they do not really know what they want 
what it is they're doing to actually do. So I would start there uh, with people. Number one is like, if you're hiring people, like, what do you want them to do? Like, I know you think you need somebody, but like, what does it look like when it's working right? These are questions most people don't know how to ask. So like I say to salespeople all the time, like when you're great at sales, what does it look like? What are the results you're getting? Oh yeah, I'm selling a lot of people. We're making a lot of money. No, no, no. What does it look like? Because if it's just about sales and making money, you're missing it. Quality of life. What is the thing that we're after? So I think the biggest question we've got to ask right off the bat is, what is it that, um, what is it you're after? What is it you want it to do? Because I think a lot of times the, the decisions we make in our lives, this is where my book Average Sucks comes in. It's like a lot of times people think it's about being better than other people, but we make decisions in life. I would say 99% of our decisions we make are out of problem mode. We're out of like, Something screwed up or, oh my God, I got a Band-Aid issue here. Put a Band-Aid on it. Just lost everything. I got to figure it out. So what happens is we get to a point where we're not where we want to be and we're willing to take anything other than what it is we have versus ultimately getting what it is we want. So what I always say to people is that, that if you really stopped and thought your entire life, even becoming an entrepreneur, came out of damage mode. It's like you either at a job you hate. You, you, you wanted to be your own boss. You wanted to figure it out. You were pissed off about something and you became an entrepreneur. If any of us thought this through, we probably never would have bothered becoming one because it's crazy <laughs> yes. to be an entrepreneur. You got to be a whack job, screw, screw loose person. But then we get so into it, it becomes our identity. So I'd say one of the biggest issues we run into and where we all need to start, a big starting point is what do we want it to do? And number two is when we realize we're here to solve a problem, what is the alternative to this problem? Because we're like, hey, we don't have enough leads. What do we do? Okay. Oh, you sell leads. I'll take you. Come here. But then we're asking like, what kind of leads do we want? Is this the kind of person we want a relationship with? How long have we worked with this person? So we make very rash decisions when we're not where we want to be. So that's one mistake that all human beings make and entrepreneurs especially. So hopefully that's the beginning of an answer for your question. Yeah, no, it's no, it's super good. So, you know, I think outcome-based thinking is something that I just started to like really, really yep. understand. And um, this might sound really weird. I hadn't done enough work or forgiveness on myself to even get into outcomes prior to this point. Like I was using entrepreneurship as a tool, right? Like I knew where I wanted to go, but when it came to like being able to describe it with texture or detail or an outcome, I couldn't go there. I like couldn't think about it. There was like this block. And so I had to kind of like, I don't want to say earn the right, but I kind of had to go through some licks and lessons to get into that clarity. Yep. And so now that I have that outcome based thinking, it started to change everything for me. And I'm, I'm noticing a lot more alignment, but also, um, requires a lot more patience on my side, right? Because I'm, I'm healing yep. from that dopamine and gratification. So when you say outcome, step one is clarity. And I think that that's probably been the most helpful one for me. And so somebody sitting here like, okay, you know, I have this problem. I need more leads. Um, you know, my website's not converting. Nobody's buying my offer, right? The easy immediate thing to do is react, knee jerk, jump in, be like, Oh, let me get more and yep. then creating permanent yep. damage down the road. Right. Yep. Because yep. some of that, you're not thinking up. it through. You're thinking short term, not long term. Yeah. 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 So how do you, what are like some of the tools that you can use? Like, so like I use ice baths, right? Like for me, like it's the only thing that shocks me into the ice present bath? moment. Yeah. Ice it. baths, man. Wake your ass up. Ooh, like you want me present, you put me in an ice bath, right? All thoughts go away, all emotions go away, and I'm in the here and now faster than I could ever get there, right? But I know what it feels like. Like during COVID, like we lost a couple companies. I lost seven figures, right? Like I felt there were times that if I didn't have the tools in my toolbox, I would have been immobile, like paralyzed, like not knowing what to do because the weight was so, so heavy. And I have so much empathy and compassion in those moments because I know what it's like to feel stuck and frozen, PTSD and, and all those other things. Yep. And so, yep. you know, we're like, oh, have outcome, have clarity. But then once you have it and you get hit with that resistance, like what are some of the tools or processes or things that people can do in their life to help them navigate those times? Yeah. So let, let's, let's take a real example here real quick. Let's take, uh, let, let's, let's bounce back and forth you and I. On this. Cool. Let's, let's do it. Let's take real let, let, let's play off this real quick. Let's take a real world equation. Let's let's like, I'll, I'll take it just on me, but like you got me here and we're live. So let's take Bill the entrepreneur, what he's dealing with and I'll solve it on the dime because I can give you generic or I can help you personally or somebody you've met like right now. Like, like there's somebody dealing with this on the show. So 
I'm going to throw it back at you. Yeah, I this love would, it. I believe be more powerful than the question. Yeah, yeah, I got Bill. I got <laughs> I got a lot of Bills, myself being Bill included, right? So, and I'm uh, plugging you in as we're listening. Keep going. Oh yeah, yeah, plug me in so our uh, our computer doesn't die over here. So, yeah, Bill. Uh so Bill pre the world being shut down, everything was good. It was cruising, things were predictable, revenue was coming in. And then all of a sudden, the world gets shut down and locked down. Amazon changes, loses product, you know, sales drop 90%, having to make hard decisions. And now Bill's through that. But it's almost rebuild or relaunch where we are. But there's so many things happening that emotionally it's completely like all over the place. And so there's a lack of clarity, number one, because the state of the world is so crazy and nobody knows what it's going to look like. And then how to find the right levers based on what's there. Now you do business coaching. So I'm asking about this particularly. So yep. for me, Bill is like, okay, uh, I either have to close this business or I have to make a big shift right now, right? Like my social's kind of working, but it's not converting to sales. The people that I had aren't buying. Again, I have to go find a new avatar. My product didn't get listed or it's not converting my website. My ads aren't working. But I think the root of it is there's so much that can be done and everything was working and everything broke at one time. And okay. so it feels okay, paralyzing. So, okay. So let, let's play with the words here real quick. And yeah. I'm going to, and we'll just, I, I say we stay together here. Cause I'm going to watch this. You're bill. And the word, so I watched you're in California, right? I'm in Cali. Okay. So I watched, I'm not going to get into politics, but I watched the guy who makes the decisions over there, uh, make announcements right around March. And he goes, California people, please stay home. This is what he said, right? Please stay home. And then a minute later, the LA times is like California's on lockdown. He never said that mm -hmm. they said that. So that terminology lockdown is designed It is strategic language to literally lock you down and mobilize you in place. It is designed by media companies to literally make you sit and read, sit and watch and basically fuck yourself, get nothing. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I don't know a better way to put it, but mm -hmm. it's made, made to make you go, huh? And be down like this and they own you that's designed no different than netflix has that little button that makes you go to the next uh, episode of of mad men or whatever it is that's on next so it's designed to do that so one of the things is language is the fastest way to change anything so i'm going to give you a little bit of little technique i i this is my favorite statement is that communication is the most underdeveloped and underutilized asset that we have as human beings to achieving anything you want in this world. I'll say it again. Communication is the most underdeveloped and underutilized asset that we have as human beings. So when people are like saying to themselves, the world is hard right now. Let me ask you a question. Is it hard or is it not what you want it to be? Because one of those is you're immobilized. It's difficult. A Navy SEAL would not call it hard. They would say this is not optimal. I know that. I work with tons of Navy SEALs. They would say the circumstances are not optimal. And that is why they're Navy SEALs, why we admire them. We go like this. Even if you don't like the military, Navy SEALs are like this. We look at them and go, badass. Okay, they're amazing. They're communicators galore. Hostage negotiation. They do incredible things. I've met a lot of these crazy guys over the years. So one of the things that I've recognized is human beings look at their situation and they do not set it up to win. I don't want you to be positive and go, this is great, but I want you to see it for what it is. Ultimately, COVID is what's called an inconvenience. It's a massive inconvenience. You had a life that was different. The other alternative is you said you want a simple technique for people. How old are you now, George? Uh, 37. 37 years old. How many months have we been dealing with nonsense? Seven. Six. Okay. You good at math? Yes. You good at math? What's seven months into like my daughter asked me quickly today what's 2000 seconds and how many hours is that i go 33 i'm quick with math right so what i reckon i'm you got to see me at a blackjack table i'd scare you what i can do <laughs> but um but what's interesting i i take over the dealer's minds it's, it's a fascinating concept we do but if i were to say out of 37 years of your life seven months of which have been very inconvenient correct mm -hmm. a lot of times we think our lives are over but if you take 37 and you divide seven months into it this is ridiculously like not a big deal. Mm -hmm. But most people, if it's going on for 37 years and seven months were good, I'd be very concerned. Yep. But what most people don't realize we use words like quarantine. We use words like Corona. We use all these things that are going on and we're losing. The other thing that we're doing is most people, and I used to teach this, this is called a phone, right? Remember these things? Yeah. Oh, oh, with a cable, with a cord. With a cable. This is like the old school, right? Yeah. Um, now, 
back in the day when I'd call people, I'd say, I'd have a lot of clients that call people money in motion. There's a lot to do with what you're sharing with me. And they give people too much credit. So they're calling a guy that just, he just left Google, got 300 million bucks. He was one of the founders of Google and you work for UBS Financial. You wanna transfer that money into your account. So when you call him, the guy could be five foot six and you could be six foot five. And you're looking up at them and you're putting them on a pedestal. I think most people don't realize they put their problems up here. The reason Joel Olstein has big Joel Olstein is because we picture up there power. We picture big up top. Most people position their problem incorrectly. Like it, when we were kids, it was Michael Jordan, Wayne Gretzky, Mike Tyson. That yep, was it. That was okay, it. Okay, Tiger Woods. That was it. Boom, bing, bam, boom. And what did we do? We put them on a pedestal. But anytime you put a problem or a person on a pedestal, you put yourself on the ground. So one of the things we need to do is call the Smurf. And I hate to say the word Smurf, but when I call people, I picture them three foot two. And the reason why is it allows me to dominate in the situation. Most people are picturing COVID, Amazon not working. They're like, they're, they're looking at it. If you're watching me and not listening, I'm like cowering down to this thing instead of looking at it like the speck. When the IRS sends me a letter in the mail, I know I don't want to read it. I look at it, I imagine it in my head. Some little guy in a cubicle sent me this letter with this typewriter. Let me see what I got to deal with today. I open it up and I learn to deal with it. But if you picture big, bad, scary agency with machine guns, which the IRS doesn't have, you're picturing them with AR-15s and you're picturing them knocking on your door. They're, they're pencil pushers. They're they have nice a stapler people. and pocket protector. Yes, they're, they're the guy from Office Space or whatever yeah. it is, right? Have so you seen my what I'm getting at is all of it comes down to framing. Yes. Your life gets easy when you frame. So like I noticed this um, in my relationship, when I first got married, my wife would say to me, listen, we're arguing. It's not over, we're just arguing. Like it doesn't mean we have, I'm like, oh, okay, well, I got it. This is a argument <laughs> in a relationship. Oh yeah, I, <laughs> I wanna say this because I think this is such a valid point and I don't know what part, and, and just full disclosure, a lot of you listening know I've done a lot of personal development work. Michael, somebody I yep. like highly respect and so, um, all of this is very validating the work that I work on every day. But one of the things for me that I noticed back in the past, and it's still, cause I'm not compartmentalized, it still comes up, but I still have a default emotional state that comes up sometimes where it's like, this happened, it's the end of the world, or I didn't communicate effectively. She wants me to move out or that didn't happen. The business is over. Now I have the tools in place to be like, okay, no compartmental, like not like frame it, right. Yep. Container it and be like, okay, nope. In this moment. Right. And, uh, you know, one of the things I ask myself a lot uh, is, "Who am I? Who am I? Who am I?" There's this awesome movie called "Chasing Great," uh, "Chasing Presence," but uh, the professor—I forgot his name—but he's the leading professor on duality. I'm gonna write this down. Yeah, it's called "Chasing the Present," um, and he's the leading professor, like most acclaimed, every award ever when it comes to duality. And okay. it was this really simple concept because in that moment. I asked myself that question, like, who am I? And I'm like, oh, I'm uh, this scared little boy, right, right, right? And it's like, well, was I born that way? No. And I'm like, oh, who am I? And I'm like, oh, well, I'm being compassionate, but also fearful, empathetic, and scarce. And I was like, was I born that way? I'm like, no. And then, like, it gets down, and eventually there's no answer to the question, and I'm who I want to be or whoever I am in that moment to moment to moment. It's a really interesting perspective. So when you think about containers and language, because yep. like you're a master at NLP and framing and all yep. those different things, I mean it, it lands heavy when you when you sit here and talk about like the media and the consumption and you know having to protect our lives from all that poison out there. But then, what are some of the, like the self talk statements? Like what are some of the empowering things that people can do yep. or say in those moments to create that container or frame those emotions or that experience to help them navigate that? Well, let's 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 do something really interesting. Let's take let's a go. step back. I feel like we're I feel like we're debating. It's like I watched the debates. It's hilarious. Oh, oh OK. Tra trained really well, but not in a bad debate. Let me go back a sentence to okay. what you were talking about. Then I'll pick that up. I have ADD like most of your listeners. So yeah, I'll yeah, got to it. Solve this. So one thing you said is pretty interesting about identity right there. So like when I was writing my book, a nine year old boy was trying to write the book. I didn't realize that Tucker had to call me out on it. It's like, <laughs> hey, dude, what are you doing? Okay, what are you doing, right? It's one of my one of my best friends. And he's like, hey, call me out. It's like, what, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? Um, and I realized that a nine-year-old boy that was trying to prove a point was writing the book. Yeah. And then one day I looked in the mirror and go, why am I fighting this thing so much? Like, what, what am I doing? And then I realized something very interesting that I was trying to prove a point that I could do it myself, that I didn't need anybody else, that I wanted to get it done. I wanted to heal myself, whatever it is I thought I was dealing with. And then one day I looked in the, the mirror and I was actually talking to Brad, Brad Costanza, one of our buddies. I was talking to Brad about this. And I... 
and I called him out right on the podcast. I said, Brad, how old are you? And he told me he was like 40 something. And I, he told me how old he was. I said, let me tell you a little story. I go, I believed I couldn't get the book done. And then I asked myself, who is writing the book? And the nine-year-old boy was trying to write the book. That's where the idea of the book came in, trying to like be important. Then I said, what would a 41-year-old man, this is a year ago, what would a 41-year-old man, me, uh, that has worked with hundreds of thousands of people all over the world, that's happily married with great kids, what can that guy do? And what's amazing is most of us haven't updated our identity in a long time to, to make decisions from who we are now versus who we were then. So one of the first things I'm gonna tell all of you is take a minute today, look in the freaking mirror. You don't want any work to do. You don't have 90 seconds. Look in the mirror and go, who am I today? I don't care if your life sucks today. I'm a guy or girl that has been through a bunch of shit. I'm still alive and I've made it is different than I'm a person that doesn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So what I'm getting at is most of us have to, the first thing we need to do is look in the mirror and goes, who's actually making this decision? The problem is as a business owner, most of us are still operating off who we were instead of who it is we want to be. So when I sit down with people from a coaching perspective, the first thing I ask them is, what was your original reason for making money? And they're like, oh, I wanted financial freedom and I wanted um, to prove a point and I wanted to be my own boss. How long you been in business? Eight years. Awesome. Do you have financial freedom? Kind of. Okay, good. Uh, are you your own boss? Yes. Have you proven a point? Yes. Then shut up and work on the next thing. Now it's about being profitable. We've got to move on. Most of us do not realize that you're farther along than you think you are. It's just your old you is running your life. There's multiple losses inside of ourselves. So a lot of us don't recognize that your brain is different than your mind. Your brain is your, your like an organ. Your mind is the operating system. Like your Mac computer is your brain. The operating system, Snow Leopard 468732OS. That is your mind. And your mind's main focus is keeping not you alive, is keeping your identity alive. What you've said is necessary to be true. So that's going back to the thing we shared a minute ago. Now, the next question you asked was, the next question you asked is, what do people do? And, and can you frame that last part for me again? Because I'm gonna add these two things together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, to, keep it, to keep it short. So, oh, when feeling that way and getting into framing, like yep. what do they do to, to reframe? Right. And then yep. take a step forward in that new interpretation, that empowering interpretation. Yep. There's three things that control everything we do. Number one is language. Language is made up of 85 different things. Language. I'm just making up 85. It could be 80,000 things. There's the words, <laughs> the intensity of the words, the tone, the word choice, the modality of the words, a million things. Number one is check your language. And the reason I'd say is there's another way to say what it is you're saying more intense or less intense. Like, is it a failure? Is it a catastrophe or is it an inconvenience? Those are three different words with three different sets of emotions. Mm -hmm. So on, I call it gradient language, but on each side of the word is another way to say it less intense and more intense. Now you've got to ask yourself which way you want to go. Number two is pattern. We all have patterns in our lives and you've got to ask yourself like right now we have patterns. We have like, what do we do? Like I didn't realize when COVID first hit, I'm a I'm a personal responsibility survivor type. Like I actually sadistically do really well during chaos. So when I'm playing hockey and a guy the other day got a blade to cross his neck, I got, I got a EMT on my team, not EMT, a plastic surgeon on my team, three doctors and a lawyer. Everybody runs, but me and the plastic surgeon, the people that are used to blood. I go, you get, even the referee didn't know what to do. You take your Jersey off, wrap it around his neck. You go call the ambulance right now. I do really well during chaos. So what's one of my patterns? So I've got to learn how do I selectively create chaos when I need it? Now, if you do not do good during chaos, you've got to then find a way to frame that differently yourself. So we've got language, we've got patterns. And number three is it's our state of being. Like what state are we actually in? And I always know that like a lot of times we try to fight through. Lowering your head and trying to get through your problem is about the stupidest thing you can do. I always tell everyone, just give up. And the reason I say give up, give up for an hour, give up for a day. Back in the day when I didn't feel like working, I would go to Dave and Buster's, I'd go play video games. And the reason why is you're not going to do it. The reason you don't want to do it, if you were fearful, that's one thing. But if you've been in business eight, 10 years and you're having a bad day, you're done. Day's over. You're done. Don't go drink. I don't I'm not a drinker. I mean, if you want to drink, drink. I don't recommend drinking. That messes with the brain. But go do something. Go play tennis, do an ice bath, get the hell out of there. You need a clear perspective. You will not solve the problem inside of it. You've got to get into a different state. So Virginia Satir, one of my uh, earliest mentors that I had, she's one of the people like the predecessors of NLP, said, we got three states. We've got decision-making mode, okay? We've got problem mode and we got resource mode. But you can't make a decision unless you're in resource mode. 
but you won't be in resource mode when you're in the problem. So just imagine for a second, you got three cards in front of you. Like these are three napkins, but imagine one napkin said problem. One napkin said solution. Okay. A, res a resource. And the other one said decision. And you put them out in front of you and go, which mode am I in? Problem, resource, and decision. And if you can't find a, if you're in a problem, you need to very quickly get into a resourceful state so you can make a decision and then you come back and solve the problem. And that's the one thing I got to recognize. Learning how to become aware of that is how you get a Navy SEALs mentality. Yeah, man, like I, I love that. Th those three modes, uh, it's actually similar to how Disney did it when they were doing business. They had three separate offices for ideation, for the execution, and then for the critic, yep. right? But like, I've read about that. Yeah, that, that same frame is really powerful. And you and I are super alike. Um, and this has come up a lot in my life because I grew up in chaos. I then joined the yep. Marine Corps for three combat deployments and I excelled. You're a devil dog. Yeah, I, yeah, it's somewhere hidden in the corner over here. I excelled. I saw it, buddy. I saw yeah. it. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, I excelled in that. But then one of the things that you just said that really caught me off guard in a good way and I think is going to be super helpful for me is there's a lot of my life where um, – you know, recognize that pattern. I made that pattern wrong that like I was good under chaos or I was good under pressure because I was framing it incorrectly. And you, you said knowing when to create that or when to turn that on. Um, and so I don't know, can you, can you just expand on that for me? Because that one's super applicable to me, Michael, like I tend to subconsciously or unintentionally create chaos, right? Things would be good and I'll, you know, lob a bomb, right? Because then I'm comfortable or like somebody will talk to me, give me feedback and uh, it'll be completely nothing and I'll blow it out of perspective so I can win my way back because I'm, I thrive in that situation. But you like problems. You like solving things. Yes. Okay. So there's a bunch of ways to, there's a bunch of ways to take this one on. Number one is we've got to realize that everything we do has a positive intention. That's one of my favorite beliefs. And oh, it's hard that. for people to accept that quitting is a good thing and procrastination is good. Some of you listening go, screw this guy. What's he talking about? Quitting is good. Let me explain real quick. If you can quit Little League, you can quit coach, You can quit uh, quit smoking when you get older. If you can procrastinate, which is a wonderful technique. How is procrastination good? Procrastination is fantastic because if you can procrastinate over eating, you will be in better shape. Most people do not recognize that procrastination, quitting, these are all positive things. So your ability to go into chaos and solve problems is a beautiful thing when used appropriately. What you haven't learned how to do is understand the margins when to turn it on and when to turn it off. So here's the deal. If you needed to get going, I don't want you to get rid of it because you'd get boring. I wouldn't like you anymore. You wouldn't be intense. If Mike Tyson didn't know how to work up a frenzy, he would never have been Mike Tyson. We would have never looked up to him. He would have never been one of the greatest fighters in the world. No chance in hell. So we've got to learn how to do it. So the question is, do you know how to turn it on? Yes. But do you know how to turn it off sooner than before it's too late? Like, do you know how to use it to your advantage and recognize what it is? No, not yet. Not yet. Like full di full disclosure and like I guys on the pod, we're going there because I love Michael and I trust him inherently. So a yep. lot of thousands of you get to listen to this live, um, yeah, or great. or when it's when it's released. But no, for me, um, I can turn it on now with all the right reasons and all the right parts. The margin I blow out by a landslide, and I don't see it until after. Like I haven't got the distinction of the awareness when I'm in the margin yet. I miss the cues because I'm still. What, what I make up is I'm still, I have some unhealed trauma or I'm just so far in it like blinders on because I'm so comfortable but also so afraid at the same time that I can't, I can't see those margins. So no, I haven't figured that out yet. Are you comfortable or are you being effective? I'm comfortable. Okay, very good. So you're comfortable in the chaos? Yeah, super comfortable. Okay, very, very good. Okay, are you uncomfortable when the chaos goes away? A lot of times. Okay, very good. Is it because you're bored and you like solving problems? So you identify as a guy that likes to solve problems, correct? I derive my val I've derived my value and worth from my ability to add value or solve something, which is the work that I do on spending time alone because inherently I have a lot of codependent tendencies in nature due to my childhood. So I spend a lot of time alone working on being comfortable in that absenceness or just by myself. Okay, so are you uh, codependent? Like, is that is that like is that a a, a, a like a diagnosis? Yeah, or? yeah, no, that would that was a yeah that was a previous diagnosis. I've been through a couple twelve step programs and and all of that. So those were tendencies I had from my childhood and my trauma that have come into entrepreneurship well. And so uh, this this 
Yeah, basically, uh, I'm super uncomfortable when there's no chaos. Okay. Is he uncomfortable or you don't know what to do? I don't know what to do. Okay. Those are two different things. So let me just ask you again. Are you uncomfortable or you don't know the next step? I don't know the next step. Okay. So do you know the difference between building and solving? In theory. Okay. Well, tell me what you think the difference is because those are words and they're interesting how words have meaning. Yeah. But what's the difference between solving and building? Uh, the difference between building and solving is uh, in uh, building would be the doing, executing the task or the solution that you came up with solving. So solving would be ideating, getting clarity, creating an outcome, and then building would be executing what you created that clarity on. Okay. So are you less comfortable in building something and more comfortable in solving things? I am more comfortable in solving things. Yes. So no one really taught you how to build things? No. Okay. So bottom line is you don't have sophistication when it comes to building, but the thing you want revolves around building. Mm -hmm. So you really have a lack of understanding of building. You really don't have a codependency issue. It's that building requires you to take responsibility for actually to build something from scratch so you like to build things or uh, like it's a hallucination the way you're building is you're building by solving a problem so you like to hallucinate build versus yeah. what you really want is things to be sturdy correct yes okay so um so with that said you never looked at it that way did you no okay so the issue you're having is no different than other people is it's not that things aren't the way you want them to be it's not that you like chaos so much it's that Chaos is comfortable and building is something you're not very familiar with. Mm -hmm. But what happens when you decide to get good at something and dedicate your time to it? What happens? Um, I, I go hard in the paint all the way. Okay. What does that mean? Um, just tangible examples. Like I wanted to be good at golf. So I got down to a three handicap. I wanted to scout out so right. a thousand jumps in a year and a half. I wanted to scuba dive so I became a dive master rescue diver in a week and a half like i i i just tend to go all the way got it hard so this is just an area that you've never actually applied yourself yet. yes yes and it comes up everywhere it comes up primarily in uh in interpersonal relationships so do you believe possibly and i am throwing you out there on your go show help you out with this you had some challenges as a kid it sounds like parental stuff i don't know your whole backstory yeah, yeah yeah there's some stuff mom dad different types of things challenges this that whatever blah 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 whatever yeah we'll leave that where it belongs we'll let the therapist handle that but the point is what i realized when we stunt our growth we think we can't grow and we like to protect versus grow so my question is what if you did what i said and you thought about this like what is the, what are you capable of today? Like, this is the question that I asked Brad um, and I ask you, um, what can you do from the position you're in? Like, what could you build? Like, if you were to be outside of you and hire you, what could that guy do? If I was to be outside of me and hire me, what could uh, he do? And, and without the stories, without the, like, cause if you hired you, you would, that person wouldn't show up with the drama and the stories and the diagnosis. They would show up with the ability, correct? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And so you would never hear about it. Like if you hired them and you paid you 150,000 bucks a year to accomplish a job, what job could that guy do? Yeah, so applicably in my business right now, could write the curriculum for my mastermind, could record the seven video ads, could develop the email strategy for the next three months in a matter of an hour. Okay, that guy could do that? Yes. Because you would hire that guy to build. So the question is, have you put this person in the right job? So what you have this person doing in the, in the Marines, there's the, there's like the commander, there's the night watchman, there's the, there's the guard, there's PT duty, there's, you know, cutting potatoes. Like what job did you sign yourself up for? Like, what is your automatic job that you're signed up for? Is it protector or is it builder? Cause I think you forgot that you know how to protect yourself right now. You know how to use a weapon. You know how to use your hands, mm -hmm. you know, self-defense, you're badass. I think you forgot that you could stop protecting cause you've already got that part down. And I think mm -hmm. you need to flip into a different mode, which means your identity needs to shift. And I think you just forgot to update your operating system. You're operating off a, an LG. Uh, what was that thing back in the day? You're operating off the old razor phone. The razor Remember phone. the razor yeah. R -A -Z or the star tech motor. Yeah the star tech and you forgot you have an iPhone XY 476 yeah. and you realize you've already got protection protection. 99% of the world would never want to get into an altercation with you physically or verbally. Yeah. So you've already got protection down. I think we can put that off to the side and we can go into building mode. And I think a lot of people can get out of lockdown mode and a lot of people can get out of worry mode and we can start going into building. And I think we're just a little bit behind. Yeah, man. I, uh, I'm, I'm actually, I have tears welling up and, and I appreciate you. I know I can see it. I, I love know. you. That's why I'm doing it. I know. This I know. Right and now. well, yeah. and this is why I have people like you in my life. 
because I get coached on this by Stephanos all the time. <laughs> I talk about this all the time. Um, and, and, and the distinct, and, and I love it. Um, I do, I'm, I'm protecting and it's this interesting thing and it, it almost seems like a conundrum to me because I say like, I, I'm comfortable in the chaos and then, um, but when I'm in it and it motivates me, then I'll protect myself even more because it gives me some semblance of safety. Like it's okay. this. So you value, you value protection massively, don't you? I, I do. I do. And when you value protection, you protect every aspect. You protect your finances. You don't want to lose things. You worry about stuff, all that kind of stuff. But here's the thing. Nobody could pay you to stop being a protective person. It's who you are. It's mm -hmm. your soul. So you could actually stop trying to do it. You'll do it automatically. Yeah. What if you were to take it down 20% and not even try to do it anymore? Like just, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just going to put it off to the side. I'm done protecting. I'm going to focus on building for the next six, eight months. I'll always be a protector because that's who I am yeah. innately and it'll show up as I need it. But let me ask you a question. You've never attempted to shift your identity, have you? Oh, I have a lot. But have you moved it to something like building versus protecting? Um, yeah, that's why we have a podcast. It took me nine years. I get it. But have you ever said that to yourself very simply that, you know what? I'm going to shift my perspective. I don't need to worry about protecting because I'm going to do it automatically. No, I've never, I've never used language to do that. See, or yeah, like made that declaration. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, I would give it a shot. I believe you've already done it. I see you leaning forward and how simple it is to do. But I'll tell you that um, you've got it in you. You're automatically going to be a protector. Like automatically, every one of you is going to be an entrepreneur. You need to stop trying to be an entrepreneur. You need to stop building something. Stop trying to prove to people you're an entrepreneur and start building something that works. Mm -hmm. So anyways, that's just a side note on everything. I can't solve everything in one. one. No, I, well, I think I, I, I actually think it's super, super powerful. Not even a side note, like just the main, the main, it's a massive main vein for me. And I know it's out there a lot because like, as you even said that, and you're talking about like me being the protector, I also will intentionally default to it out of, uh, out of the fear of growth, right? Because that creates vulnerability and I don't know what it looks like and I have to build. And it's, it's like, I've had these opportunities to declare myself a builder and, but I will only declare myself a builder in that container in which I think I can control. And what you're saying is very, very powerful for me. Um, it's very, very powerful. I think it's powerful across the board. Like when you think about this and COVID and everything, like, uh, you know, like I'm, I'm super, super excited, grounded and emotional in this moment and present because this is the, the narrative of my life and it applies everywhere. And, um, you know, I do this work all the time and, you know, there's parts of my, I, a lot of the times I even, I even call the work hard. Like I make the work hard. Because I'm like, look how hard I can do it. Look, I'm protecting. Look, and it's just recreating all these patterns from, you know, the abuse as a kid, the sex abuse, the physical abuse, the death in the Marine Corps, all that stuff. Um, and I've never intentionally so the shifted the, the identity. The reason you like it to be hard is you get, you get more validation when it's hard because you, a thousand you want to percent. prove that you could do something. Yeah. And we love things to be difficult. That's what entrepreneurs, we, we're sadistic. We like things to be hard. And I can yeah. only speak to this because I understand and I've been through it. We want it to be hard because we feel like we'll get a double reward or a double validation. Yeah. Wake up call is this. You don't get extra credit for being harder. Okay. A win is a win is a win is a win. It depends what you're after. So if you're a basketball or hockey or football, whatever it is, when you win, you won. Whether you beat a good team or a not good team, a W is a W, right? A win is a win. We think we get extra credit for doing something more difficult. That's our ego talking. So for, for a lot of people, we, we want to find that instead of realizing your job in life is to find to make your life easier than it is, not to make it more complicated. So the reason you're doing it is, and I don't need to explain it, whether you're trying to impress your dad or you're trying to show some how tough you are, prove a point, whatever, finally get love that you never got, whatever that story is. And the reason why I hear people starting to use the word trauma, I, I think about that. It's like that word is so debilitating in a lot of ways because trauma means permanent scar that cannot be gotten rid of. Bottom line is like when I talk about AA, uh, a lot of times I always say step 13 is missing. And step 13 is after you've been sober three, four, five years. Step 13 is I used to live a way that didn't work for me. It's yeah. a better way to put it. Step 13 is declaring I used, I'm different now and really owning that instead of I'm an alcoholic. You've been sober 50 freaking years. You don't need to declare you're an alcoholic at 50 years sober. I think you'll be okay. You've been sober more than you've been drunk. But the point is, and I don't mean no disrespect. I've been around Bill W's program for a long time. I don't drink myself. But the point is, the why I'm bringing this up to you and why it's important is 
is understanding that we need to leave that where it was. You are not that person anymore. And that's a big piece of the puzzle. A lot of us have to realize it's not March anymore. We're not in lockdown anymore. We just have a different world than the one we had prior. And we need to accept, okay, things aren't the way I want them to be. How long am I going to cry? And then we got to move on. Yeah, man. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I don't know what that does, but it does something good. Yeah, of course it does. I mean, I and just so everybody know, watching or listening, we're on video, and I know Michael really well, so I know he's watching everything I do with my body, like leaning in and do yep. it. And this is his, this is his absolute mastery. But Michael, one of the things for me is, um, you know, what that simplified for me is, you know, I've been in this game for a long time, doing this work and having it, and it really always comes down to the simplicity of it, right? It really, really. We're not getting an extra trophy, but even that, just simply plugging in or, or putting myself into one of those mindsets to observe and see where I am and then creating a different a different mode is is powerful. Um, you know, one thing I did want to ask you about, and I think that this is you said this earlier, but I think it's it was prevalent for me, so I know it's probably prevalent for other people. When I started as an entrepreneur, my drive for success was to prove I could be it, right? I could prove I could do it, yep. right? And then I made it. And then you did it. I kept that belief and I lost a lot of it again because I felt like I'd lost the fuel. And then a lot of the times for the years, like I was like driven by insecurity. I was driven by fear. I was driven by external validation. And then, you know, there are times in my life where I've been grounded and present and not really knowing how to value myself. And I was afraid and I've had moments of like in those moments, I don't know what to do, right? Like, what do I do? Where do I go? And, you know, we talked about it with building, but I just think, I don't know. I just don't think this topic is talked about enough in entrepreneurship because it's so easy to live in the hustle culture that should be cancel culture. And I, I just think it needs to be talked about more. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that. Cause when you said it earlier, you're like, you know, we build something to do it, but then you don't change your identity. Like, Oh, you wanted to create financial yep. freedom. Then you did it. You wanted to do this. Then you did it. And the thing that I struggled with is that when I was in those moments, um, when I started to shift, I felt like I had no fuel. Like I felt like I had no energy because I didn't know the outcome or the clarity and I wasn't trying to prove anything anymore. And so I felt, it took me six months, by the way, like when I walked away from a company before I like really got into flow again, it was like six months of when going to this? Dave and Buster's. This was uh, 2016, 2016, yeah. uh, when I walked away from- And that's okay. Yeah. And that's the part people don't get. That's okay. We live in this world, we think we have to- push all the time. You don't have to be on all the time. That's the part most people don't get. You do not have to be on all the time. Yeah. So when I talk about this, your original reason for going into business, the reason I love that question, I ask people that they tell me, and then I look at them and go, have you achieved that already? So yes. Yeah, so, okay, great. Are you willing to stand on top of that now and build from there? You can always go back there or be willing to stand on the fact that you've already pulled that off. Our reasons for things change. Like I'll give you an example. Like I, I had trouble exercising in my mid thirties. Couldn't figure out why I couldn't do it. I'm an athlete my whole life, played hockey my whole life, gained in some weight, not feeling good. Why can't I exercise? And I realized my original reason for going to the gym was a 16 year, 15 year old boy uh, was playing ice hockey, wanted to defend myself. I wanted to um, impress women. I wanted to uh, look good. And I wanted to, uh, what was the other reason? I, my, my buddies did it. And then mm -hmm. I'm 35 years old. I don't have any buddies that work out with me. I just don't have that right now. I'm mean, got a kid, right? Nothing going on there. I att attracting other women is not a good idea when you're married. It's most people that's probably not recommended, right? We're going to avoid that. Some people are into that. That's not our thing. Um, beating people up. You go to jail uh, when you do that at that point in life. So I couldn't do it. Work out to me meant something I say I'm going to do that I don't do. So in my head, I said, let's go to language. And I started training for a Spartan race. Think of the difference between word train, which is a fresh new word I've never used before. And then there's the word workout. Mm -hmm. Most people, the word entrepreneur needs to never be used again. I know you want to impress people by it. It means you work hard. It means you think you're special. Stop thinking you're special. It's your issue. Entrepreneur leads to the death graveyard of impossibilities and burnout, right? It leads to that Gary V grind and hustle. I don't want his freaking life making a video every day of the week. I never seen his kids unless he's got a system I don't have. The dude's obsessed with working. Glad I'm Good not the him. only one that no. said this because I've said this publicly before. I'm like, well, training your children that work is more important than them because you never see them. Yeah, I, I've been realizing this now. Like, I'm working my ass off during this stuff, and my kids are home more. I'm like, damn, I, I. I I'm not liking maybe even what I set up for myself. So maybe we need to stop um, stop calling it entrepreneurship, stop calling it business owners because our connection to those is hard work, yeah. which you does require to get started. 
I'm talking to the guy that's been a girl that's been in the game five to seven to 10 years, 15 yep. years, 20 years. I'm not talking to the noob. newbie, crush it, kill it, go work as hard as you can, get moving. But for the people that have been in the game a long time, maybe we need to evaluate what we even call ourselves instead of realizing, okay, um, I'm building something that allows me to do this. I'm not a business owner. I'm seeking out opportunity. I don't want to be cheesy about it. But like when I ask what your original reason for going to business was to impress people or to prove a point, then you're a decade later, you're looking to do the same thing. You've got to, we've got to mature past that. So the part of that is, is relanguaging it is. So I went from working out to training and now training is not hard. It's something I work towards and it's got a target. Now I train my body and my mind. Yeah, man. I, well, and it comes back to what we talked about in the beginning. Like what is the first step? It's having an outcome, like a clear outcome. Yep. And you know, back in the day when I used to do personal development, it was like, you, you can't hit your new destination when you're staring out the back of the boat, right? Like you're just going to sink the Titanic. And so I went through something similar, by the way, in my mid thirties about like the fitness. Cause I went from this hard Marine CrossFit competitor to all of a sudden I was like hating the gym, not getting up, eating like crap. And it was, I, I wasn't, I was trying to out train my past instead of like looking at something that I wanted to accomplish. And I think that's super there. What Mike McCallowitz calls it, you might appreciate this. He says, you're never allowed to call yourself an entrepreneur for the same reasons. Call yourself a shareholder. He's like, because your performance and your payment is directly tied to, um, you know, the success of your company where your hands are in. And I think it's a really, really novel point um, to not own those labels and to not carry those around. Right. And so that one was a big distinction for me. It's funny because I've, you know, probably met 300 people since I read that book and I've said like, oh, what do you do? I'm like, I'm an entrepreneur. Oh, I'm a, I'm a shareholder. And they're like, All right. and I still correct myself. Right. And it, it feels like the word entrepreneur is like toxic tongue for me at this point. And I haven't like broken the habit because it was, it was a really powerful label for me. I was like, look, I'm the only person in my family that didn't end up on drugs, dead or in an addiction facility. And I own things. And so, you know, like there was a part of me until probably 36 years old that just wanted when anybody from home, like people I don't talk to or if that magical Facebook friend adds me 25 years later and they ask or see what I do, I'm like, look, I fucking made it. I showed you. And at the same time, it wasn't really doing anything for me, right? I wasn't spending more time with my family. Here's the cool part. This is why I married the right woman. My wife would look at me. Of course you made something. Now what are you going to do? That's what my wife would say. (laughs) That mine too. So if you, if you actually saw you for what you were, um, you wouldn't be impressed by what you've done yet. How tall are you? Five seven. How big do you play? About six ten. You sure? Are you sure you're not playing five one compared to other people? Are you sure you're not playing five one? Compared to what you're capable of in your heart, Com- how big are you playing? Maybe you got it wrong. Compared, co- let me actually, ask you a question. Yeah, you're how right. How good are you at sales? How good are you at sales? Really good. Okay, compared to Bobby Axelrod and Billions, how good are you at sales? Mm, on a scale of one to ten, like a three. Okay. So my question is, why do we keep on telling ourselves we're tens? Our biggest issue in life is we think we're great. That's our biggest fuck up. Well, then and why are you the, the greatest in the world at language? <laughs> um, one of the greatest. And that, that's a, that specific marketing. I'm kidding. I love you. Man. And I, I, what, no, no, let, let, let's, let's, let's really play with that for a minute. Um, I believe that for marketing purposes and for belief systems, but then I didn't have to regulate myself said, I know I just said that, but I need to continue to own that. Totally. That's a particular area of my life. So now here's the deal. I've been working on it 20 years. You know what I mean? I've been at this a long time. 23 years old, I started. I'm 43 next week. The point is, um, the point is why I'm bringing this up is you got to realize all of us, like I sat down with a sales guy. How good are you at sales? He goes, I'm great. What'd you make last year? I made 92,000. Great. Compared to how much you want to make, how good are you? I guess I'm not that great. Yeah. So the point is, if all of us recognize we're not as good as we think we are, that is, the, your day or life changes is when you accept you're not where you want to be. Yeah. That is the most beautiful thing. So I learned that you live in the life you have when you were in the Marines that I don't want to do this anymore. You said, I don't want to be here anymore. Yeah. What else do I want? I'll be an entrepreneur. Never thought it through. Started building a box, made an identity. I'm an entrepreneur. I struggle. Got some people that are going to cheer you on. You built your box, I call it, your average. Yeah. You built this box for your life, but everything you want is outside of it. So there's three ways to get where you want to go. I'll give it to you real simple. Number one, build a ladder. Get out of where you're at. It's very hard, but build a ladder. Good luck learning how to build a ladder without any wood. Number two, lower your head, try to get through the wall. That's what we do, it doesn't work. Number three, let somebody help you very hard. And number four is outgrow the wall. And how you outgrow it is by working on becoming honest. And here's why I say this is, if you actually would look in the mirror and go, I'm not as good as I think I am, and I'm actually capable of, but I'm actually capable of 10 times more, 
that gives you room to grow and it makes unlimited possibilities and massive insecurity in the same breath. But how cool is that? Yeah. Your insecurity is that you're capable, you just don't know how. And then all you gotta do is figure out how and you grow again. Well, that's I, my that's my excitement point. No, I I love it. And and two things, because everybody listening, um, I, Michael and I have spent a lot of time in person together, couple, and I love going yep. back and forth. But in in full disclosure, there's a lot of times that I hang my current value on my past achievements, and that keeps me small. And it keeps me in that box of average or comfortable. And so, like, I love this conversation and appreciate it because there's been some big shifts even as of late, like different levels of noticing that and where I can improve and. It's funny because for the first time ever, I've brought an outside help, like four people better than me in all these areas that are helping me get there, coaching right. me and building with me. Um, but one of the things that you just said, and you said this earlier, and it's been an open loop for me that I want to close. Um, one of the things that I caught subtly is when you were talking about language, um, I forgot the two words you used, but you just used another one of insecurity. And my immediate go-to is noticing how there's no negative meaning on the word. It means opportunity. It means possibility. And there were two other ones you used earlier too. Um, but even in that moment, I found myself when you said insecurity, getting uncomfortable. I'm like, oh, I don't want to be insecure. I'm like, no, I do because it's opportunity. Why is insecure uncomfortable? Think of the word. Let's just go to the word. Let's take all the meaning out of it. What does it mean? Insecure. I'm not secure with it yet. I don't know. I'm not comfortable with it yet. Yeah. So bottom line is anything you've never done before, you're insecure about. You don't have security around it. You're not certain of it. Yeah. So bottom line is anytime you're going to go to do something you've never done before, there's always going to be insecurity and opportunity. But once you deal with the insecurity, you get the opportunity and the gap shows up of who you really are and who you want to be. And they show up in this, and that's the new opportunity. So that's the insecurity. Like if you want to pull a new move, like I play hockey, I want to do like a cool new move that I'm going to do. It's, I don't know if it's going to work or not. I got to be willing to be insecure momentarily to test it. All growth comes out of insecurity. Yeah, man. Yeah, because you got to be. They don't teach that in school. No, <laughs> they don't teach much anything in school. I sat down with my daughter and I sat down. I got to take her figure skating soon. No, so I sat down with my daughter um, and we were doing her first book report, right? And um, I sat down with her. I said, Maya, we're about to do what's called a rough draft. You don't know what a rough draft is. Let me explain what a rough draft is. This is a, we're going to write something that is not the final product and it's not going to be great. And we have to be comfortable doing things that are not great. So then we can make them better. Mm -hmm. And I don't think most people are taught that failure is the, is the gateway to becoming great. You've got to not do well to do well. Yeah, man. And, and I, and I, I love it. Like, I think for me rapping, um, you know, average does suck. And when I love every time I talk to you, I consume your content. I see you, I watch your calls. Like it, I feel like it pulls me to a new level, but what it really does is it plugs me back in to like the present. Yep. Right. And the, the, yep. the meaning that we put on a lot of things and like of anything today, like even right now, like my heart is like full. Like I've had, I had a pretty interesting morning, pretty stressful with some stuff. And I went and worked, I, I went and exorcised it. That's what I call it. Like exorcising those demons and getting clarity. Um, but even now, right. like my heart's warm and I feel good and grounded about, just how simple it is to change my frame, to change my lens. And the biggest label, the biggest difference that makes with labels and language for me, because I catch myself now, like I, I even caught it when we got in the beginning of the call. If I think back to when we synced before we hit record, like giving updates, I was using disempowering language because it was comfortable for me. And I want to be like, look, but I made it and I did it and I did it and, you know, I'll get out of it. And so I just want to thank you for that. It's, it's You're powerful welcome. stuff, man. Like, it's powerful stuff. So I do want to tell people um, before we go for everybody listening. Thanks for you know being here for for this one. And uh, this is fun. I'm not I'm not sweating, which is good. That means I'm super comfortable. I sweat when I'm uncomfortable. Um, when it comes to your calls, you do something really special right now, and I want everybody to know about it because uh, you know what you just did with me is nothing compared to like what I've seen you do in rooms with people, you know, with waiters, with people asking for breakthroughs and feedback and in your trainings. But can you tell everybody? Um, like what you're doing on calls and where to best find you for that. Yeah. I mean, when COVID hit, my wife and I looked at each other, this is, this is interesting. You'll, you'll appreciate this. I, um, when COVID hit, we had two opportunities because when 08 and 09 hit, my wife and I said, never again, we weren't married then, but we said, never again, we're never going to get bumped like this. So when COVID hit and everybody else got knocked over, we we're like, wait a second, we built our lives to be in a position to do what we do best right now. I can't do events. I got multi-million dollars worth of revenue and events that I cannot do right now. And what do we do? We got to help people. 
So we've been running a program for 17 years called Call to Action. And it's a it's physically over a, a real phone line. Like it's not Zoom. It uses the auditory sense because the fastest way to transform your unconscious mind is auditorily. It's not visually. It's not kinesthetically. It's literally through the audio sense of rewiring the words. So for 17 years, we've been doing a program called Call to Action. And in the last seven months, we've given away $3.5 million worth of it away. We're literally giving it to entrepreneurs, people that are at home, people that want to take the time, instead of saying, hey, you should read my book. I mean, definitely get Average Sucks. Read the book. Definitely recommend it. But why not spend a little bit of time with me? You know, work with me, spend five days. If you like me, we can go from there. Absolutely free, no strings attached. It's a fully inclusive course. Yes, there's other stuff that, you know, we you can take advantage of, but um, I'd love to work with you. So it's five days on kicking your butt, holding your hand, understanding what motivates you, how to get out of your comfort zone, the skills to make it work, how I work with people, communication. It's all laced with language and NLP and everything. All you have to do is go to this website, call to actiontime.com and through the end of the year at least we're going to be giving this away for you teammates friends anybody you care about it's a 600 hundred dollar program all i ask is respect the fact that our company's in triage mode which means we it's not easy to hire right now so like we have a small staff thousands of people that want this right now so if you're going to do it do it call to actiontime.com with the number two call to actiontime.com and i'll leave it up to you it's five days it's live it's not this whole like digital thing it's me you get me you and it's so interactive and so real that it's going to freak you out you're going to be like this crazy guy from jersey we're on the same team so if you like my style check that out i'm going to kick your ass we're going to have some fun but you're going to deal with some stuff we're going to have a good time so you'll love it so check it out it's on me my gift to you and and I feel just blessed that I can give this to people right now, and I'm in a position to do that. Yeah, man, and one of the things that I love about you is from the moment we met, um, that's the sense that I've gotten at every single ounce of it. Like you and Deborah, and everything that you do, you guys just exude what you build you. and what you believe in. And like I haven't been to an event because – there haven't been any since we've known each other. Really, has been a few, but uh, you know, at some point in the world, we'll break bread and jump in. And just yes. so everybody knows, Michael's like a foot and a half taller than me too. You know, because I'm a micro. But not here though. No, right here, right here on Zoom. It's however I'm. I'm the Joel Osteen. If we're going to use that as an example, I'll be the nine yep, foot I'm Zoom go guy. Like this. Yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you were cowering in the corner, I was like, "This is actually fun. You can play with these dynamics on Zoom too." You would be the guy that figured that all out. But for everybody listening, I want to make recommendations. So I've read Michael's book. I absolutely love Michael's book. Um, I do believe average sucks and I love the box analogy and really outgrowing the box and, and challenging ourselves and really pushing. And, you know, I have so many takeaways from this. This will be an episode I go listen to again. So guys, go get, go get the book average sucks. And then the website again is call to action time.com, but the yeah. number two for the two, right? Yeah. I think you can use TO also, but just use the number two. That'll be fun. Use the number two. So the one thing I just want to ask you to end the show um, I won't speak after this, but would just love any parting words of wisdom for anybody. If you could leave everybody listening with one thing, a direction, a focus, a thought, a distinction, um, you know, carve your tombstone yep. in this moment for me. Yeah. I, I mean, my, my tombstone's already picked out. It's called all used up, nothing left, did everything <laughs> that I could. It doesn't say father. It doesn't say husband. It doesn't say dad. It says, um, it says uh, all used up, nothing left. I'm just going to put it like this is that your future hinges on your ability to effectively communicate. And although you were not taught this, although you you may not have been shown it in school, or no, no one sat you down, it's your responsibility from this day forward to own and dominate the communication in your life. And the first place to look, like one of my goals and my missions in life, and I wanna leave you as part of this mission, is to realize that communication is an answer for everything before you go to harm something, harm yourself, before you go to pick up the bottle, or eat food, do anything, pick up a phone, recognize there's a way to communicate everything you do better to get the result that you're looking for. So look to communication as a solution to everything you want in this world. And I'll leave it at that. Well, thanks for being here. And I'm not going to do anything to steal that thunder. So guys, thanks for listening to the show. Make sure you subscribe, leave a review, go grab a copy of his book, Average Socks. Go sign up for calltoactiontime.com. Get on there. And most importantly, from this point forward, remember that relationships will always beat algorithms. See you guys in the next episode.